Welcome, welcome to the Mysterious Book Emporium. Don and Brenna Kovic is near retirement, but when he stumbles upon a body, will he have time to find the killer? Why don't you take a seat as we begin with Hard in Hightown by Varric Tethris. It's actually Mary Kirby. Hard in Hightown. Don and Brenna Kovic, an older guardsman on the verge of retirement, walks the streets of Kirkwall's Hightown with Jevlin, a younger, awkward recruit whose armor doesn't even fit right. Soon, the duo come across a dead magistrate, murdered in the shadows of Hightown. Jevlin runs to get the captain of the guard and soon returns. Captain Hendalen recognizes the body as Magistrate Seamus Dunwald. The captain heads off to find more information from the last watch, ordering Donnan to make a report from the scene. As she leaves, Donnan knows that just writing a report won't solve the case. Jevlin is unsure what to do with himself, so Donnan decides to take him along to see the Dunwald estate. Donnan and Jevlin are brought into the Dunwald estate, and despite how late it is, meets with the newly widowed Marielle Dunwald. She smells heavily of lilacs and is taken aback by the news of her husband's death. Donnan questions who would have wanted her husband dead. She reports that a letter came in the mail that was threatening, a letter with a seal of six crossed swords. Marielle goes to get the letter while Donnan pokes around in Dunwald's sword collection. She soon comes back, asking for any news if they find it. The duo leave, and Jevlin wonders what they should be doing. Donnan laments that he'll be retiring in two weeks and needs to solve his case before then. When Jevlin mentions that someone else can, Donnan says that he won't abandon a case. Donnan and Jevlin stand outside the Comte de Favre's home. They knock on his door, but there is no answer. Jevlin wonders what to do, but then the door swings open, and the Comte rushes them inside. His house is dark and empty, and the trio enter his study, where it looks like he has been living in it for a while. Donna asks the Comte if he had anything to do with Dunwald's murder, but the Comte replies that Dunwall had drawn the attention of greater powers, which led to his death. Jevlin rolls his eyes. The Comte explains that the great powers come from across the sea, and that they should not stand in the way of what they seek. Donna asks the Comte to give a statement to the captain about his fears of the great powers, but he refuses in fear, saying that they already know that he has their prize. And with that, the duo are shooed out of the room, hearing the study room lock behind them. Frustrated, Donnan tells Jevlin to go get some sleep, as what comes next won't be pretty. Back at the guard's barracks, Donnan goes to talk to his captain. She is upset that he has yet to file his report, angry that he never made a proper search of the area, and she orders him to complete his paperwork, and that no warrant will be given for the Comte, and refuses to hear anything else about it. Donnan sulks in the break room for a while before Jevlin comes in, all washed up and in a new uniform. He laments that perhaps it's for the best that they didn't get the warrant for the Comte, but Donnan informs him that the captain asked for proof, so they're gonna go find some. Donnan picks the lock on the Comte's door while Jevlin keeps an uneasy lookout. Eventually unlocking it, they head to the study, finding the freshly dead Comte. Donnan looks through the Comte's desk, finding a letter with a seal of six crossed swords. And then, suddenly, a cry comes from downstairs. The shouts of a woman yelling for my lord fancy pants. Rushing downstairs, they find a Ravani woman who is kicked in the front door. Donnan shouts to the intruder to know who she is, and she introduces herself as Captain Belladonna of the Dragon's Jewels. Donnan tells her that the Comte is dead and asks if she knew how. Belladonna responds that if she had killed him, she would have at least made sure she had been paid first. And so she shouts out to whoever wants the antique that she has brought, needs to bring her 50 sovereigns for it, and she leaves. A dozen guards search the comp's home after Donnan reports his death, and now he sits awkwardly in Captain Hendalen's office. Captain Hendalen tells him that there are concerns on how he has been handling his case, and asks him to turn in his badge. He's off the case, and spending the rest of his career in the barracks. Donnan, feeling like a failure, exits and heads to the hanged man. The barkeep Ferris brings him a mug of ale, and Donnan thinks back on the case and what he could be doing now. And, upon hearing the depressing Ferelden music, he remembers the wax seal of six cross swords. Dunning goes off into the elven alienage to knock on a door that is painted with pale yellow and white daisies. Maisie answers, happy to see Donnan. Maisie may not seem like much, but she is the most knowledgeable person at Thetis about sigilography. He hands her the seal and she is excited to see something so rare, explaining that it belongs to the Executors, a group that supposedly killed Queen Madrigal in 599, leading to the Sixth Age being named Steel Age. When Donnan asks how he can talk to this group, Maisie replies that he can't, as they aren't real. She tries to come up with places that maybe he could look, but Donnan replies that he will find a way. 
Dunnan walks in Lowtown and suddenly an arrow whizzes by his head. Ducking out of the way, he sees a man having trouble loading another crossbow bolt. And when Donnan approaches him, runs off while Donnan gives chase. But the figure is able to get away. Returning to where he was shot at, he finds that the crossbow is covered in blood, and drips of healing salve had been dripped from what seems like a bandage. The man had seemed to come from the keys, so Donnan goes to look there. Donnan spots one particular boat with a lewd carving for a masthead, the dragon's jewels. But something was wrong. Heading to its decks, he finds a trail of bloody footprints heading down below. Searching for answers, he is barely able to counter the blade that attacks him, leaving a nasty gash on his arm. Captain Belladonna shouts at Donnan for attacking her crew, but when she realizes Donnan as part of the city guard, she stops her attack. She explains that a man had attacked her and killed some of her men, but she had taken his hand as well. Donnan asks if he also took her shipment from the Comte. She says that he didn't, and gives Donnan the package, which is a rusty sword. Donnan heads to the Chantry Clinic to heal the wound on his arm. A dour blonde mage heals him, also giving him a bit of sass about the wound. On his way out of the Chantry, he sees Lady Marielle, who says that she has a lead for him. Donnan and Marielle sit in the fanciest cafe in Kirkwall. She says that she is being followed, and Donnan notices a pale ander man in a chasen sitting awkwardly in the cafe. Marielle explains that a man came to her estate, asking to buy all the swords in Seamus' collection. A man named Whale. Meryl goes on to explain that he asked her, not for her husband, to sell it. Even though not a day had passed since his death, this man seemed to know that Seamus had died. Donnan leaves Lady Marielle, saying that it seems that he needs to pay this whale a visit. In the Blooming Rose, Donnan is met with suspicion, but is allowed in. Donnan makes his way to the back to find an old man drinking cheap ale and playing cards. Garen. Donnan joins his card game and asks for information on Whale. Garen informs him that Whale is new to the city and that it seems he has been buying information on what nobles have been buying and selling. Before Donnan goes, Garen tells him to just be careful of the rookie Jevlin. When Donnan asks why, Garen just responds that he should. In the Foundry District, Donnan finds the address to Whale that Lady Marielle had given him. A butler opens the door, letting Donnan know that he has been expected. Sitting in a room covered in giant tapestries of Andraste, Whale asks Donnan to take a seat. He tells Donnan that he has a business proposition. Whale goes on to explain that he is after the Sword of Hesarian, the sword that killed Andraste, and he believes that Dunwald had bought the blade, but he cannot find it, although he believes that it is not yet out of the city, and if Donnan helps him find it, he could be a very rich man. In Lowtown, Donnan pays a little elven girl to run a message. He is still being followed by the Chasen and Anderman since his meeting with Marielle, but he goes to the Kirkwall barracks to find Jevlin. But on his empty bunk was dried blood and a note. Bring the blade to the keys tonight at midnight or the boy dies. The note was signed with a wax seal. Six cross swords. A scent like lilacs hung heavy in the air. Donnan takes the note and runs. Marielle is happy to see Donnan, but he is firm in asking where Jevlin is. She asks why she should know. Donna replies that he could smell her perfume in the barracks. Marielle calmly explains that she didn't leave the note. She doesn't have Jevlin, but she did stop by. Donna explains that he looked at the records for her and that she had only been married to Seamus for three weeks before his death. He demands to know who she's working for. She simply says that she works for the Chantry. She asks Donna if he has heard about the executors. She goes on to explain that they have his partner, not her, and that they most likely have a man in the barracks. The only person that the Comte had seen since his death had been Seamus and Donnan, and that was the only people he would have opened his door to. Donnan asks why she would marry Seamus if her plan was to just steal the sword for the Chantry, but she denies it. She says that Seamus was the one who contacted the Chantry about the sword. He had the connections, but not the money to buy it, and the Chantry had the money, but the seller would never sell it to them. Seamus would buy it and donate it. Donna asks why she would fake a marriage, but she responds that it wasn't fake. The bard explains that she had come to represent the Chantry in the deal, and that Seamus convinced her to stay. She then ends the conversation, saying that he needs to find the executors. Donna goes back to the barracks to search some more in Jefflin's bunk. It seems that the dry blood was only on the top of the bedding, not in it. Going back to his own bunk, he finds a note. Sitting on top of his footlocker was another note in a very different style. Forget the case. The magistrate's murder is long since gone. Salvage what you can in the time you have. There is no fancy wax seal to sign this note. 
But Donnan had a feeling he knew who had sent it, and he offered silent thanks to the Maker for reminding him who he was chasing. Donnan didn't have much trouble finding the Chasen and the Anderman. The two came after him, attacking Donnan, but just before he is hit again, he tells the two that he has a message for Whale. He has his sword, and he wants to meet him at the Keys tonight to talk about the price. The two go, agreeing to take the message, and Donnan heads over to the Hanged Man again to wait for midnight, asking Ferris to keep the ale coming. At midnight, Donnan waits for Whale and sees his sparkling white armor in the distance. Whale and Donnan talk about the price of the sword, but Donnan asks if it was he who killed Dunwald, remarking that the Chasen's blade was the most likely murder weapon given its jagged shape. Whale denies that he has Jevlin. Donnan hands over a package with a sword, and Whale quickly notices that this is not the blade of Hesarian. Donnan remarks that it's a pity that he killed Seamus for it then, and when Whale responds that he killed him because he just wouldn't do proper business with Whale, Captain Hendalen shouts that that is all she needs to hear for her to make her arrest. And Whale, the Ander, and the Chasen are surrounded by Kirkwall City Guard. Donnan leaves the rest of the guards to make the arrest, unsure of what has happened to Jevlin. In the rain, he almost didn't hear the ambush coming. At the top of the stairs to the high town market, he quickly steps out of the way of an oncoming attack. And he realizes it's Jevlin, who shouts to know where the Blade of Hesarian is. Suddenly, it all clicks for Donnan. Jevlin is the inside man for the executors, the one who killed the Comte, the one who attacked Captain Belladonna and lost his hand. The two fight, but when Jevlin lunges towards Donnan and stabbing him in the ribs, he slips, falling down the stairs to his death. Injured but alive, Donnan makes his way to the Chantry. Donnan steps into the Chantry to see Lady Marielle. She rushes to him, asking if he is alright. He says that he will need a healer, but he's glad that she got his message. He looks at her, beautiful as ever, and tells her that he has something for her under the altar. Confused, she finds a package and unwraps it to find a rusted sword with dried blood still clinging to it. She is in awe at the sword of Hesarian. Donnan asks if she can get it to the Divine. She says she can, and Lady Mariel asks what she can do for him in exchange for this gift. Just put in a good word for me with the Maker, your ladyship. I might need it. And he walked away towards the darkened clinic, leaving her with history in her hands. Discussion. So let's start with the elephant in the room. A lot of this book is copied from the codex entries. The new stuff mostly expands what was already there or add in a few new scenes that stitch together the codex chapters more neatly. It also makes Jevlin reveal a little bit more obvious. At a guess, and I think this is also a bit debatable, I would say that the book is about 50-50 old codex entries to new material. I know a lot of people weren't too happy with how this book came out, expecting something longer and grander, but I don't really know why. I mean, it's not like Bioware was hiding it during pre-orders. The online page says it was under 100 pages and included pictures. Although, I will say that for the Brian Bloom video where he reads from the novel, he is seen holding a very large version of the book, which is sort of weird considering how thin it actually is. Like, you can see the actual novel nestled in whatever larger book this actually is, wrapped in a cover to make it look like Hard and High Town. I think this is more just to make it look fancy, but I I don't know, guys. I think it might have been better to just use the actual book. It's a little dubious for me, but whatever. Something else I also wanted to say, and it's the most nitpicky thing in the world, but the cover of the book has this cute little quote from Meryl saying, that So many people get shivved. But no one actually gets shivved. Like, perhaps I'm wrong here, but I always thought of shivved as being stabbed with a shiv, which is a makeshift knife. While people are stabbed in the novel, it's with actual blades. So people get stabbed, they don't get shivved. Maybe that's me just being nitpicky, I don't know. Anyway, something unique about this novel is that it includes pictures, which, I mean, versions of the other novels with pictures are coming out as well, but this is the first of them, so let's talk about that. From Susaga, is it just me, or is Varric's publisher not as good as he claims? Beside letting Varric's shit I don't know would comment into the final print, the art is at odds with each other, I assume different in-universe artists, and the actual text. A scene near the start had people looking at the scene despite it being mentioned clearly that everyone was getting drunk or sleeping. One passage describes Lady Mariel's dress as black while the image showed a white dress. Jevelyn and Donnan seem to remove their uniforms every other image. This is the main complaint that I've heard about the pictures. There is a lot of inconsistency between them. 
Like Susika mentions, Donick's outfit changes a lot between photos and Mariel looks different in pretty much every one. I totally get why this is annoying, but at the same time, four different people did work on the artwork. Anyway, I think it's kind of interesting to see what four different people came up with regarding to how the characters look. Mariel is supposed to be based on a female hawk, so perhaps that was the directions they were given. She just looks like however you please. I'm, I'm not quite sure. Susugo also mentions that some of the text is awkward, and yeah, there were some moments that seemed like the new text and the old text don't mesh very well. I only remember it happening in one or two spots, but for a book that's only about 72 pages, that can be a lot. Um, it didn't, honestly, it didn't bother me too much, maybe because I have a very low uh, expectation for this. I just thought it was something kind of cute and silly. So I, I it's fine for me, but it, it, your mileage may vary. Anyway, one of the most interesting things about the pictures, actually, is that it makes obvious that Jevlin is based on Carver, well, which is something I never got from reading the Codex entries. While I played a mage, so this is hilarious for me, it could also come off really cold from Varric if Carver is dead in your world state. Right in the start, it talks about how Dawn and Suit had once been red, but it was so old the color had faded. In game, the color of the Kirkwall Guard uniform looks a lot more orange, which maybe there is an argument that this is the color that it looks like when the red is faded, but does that mean that every recruit is using extremely old and faded armor? I don't know. Uh, Kirkwall isn't described as being that poor, so I can't imagine that they just reuse a bunch of old armor, so I think that's just an error, or recently they changed to red uniforms. I don't know. But one of the best things about the book is that it includes some more Kirkwall lore. For example, there is a rich neighborhood called The Garden because everything is covered in thorn vines and the walkways are covered in moss. These houses have no house numbers but rather use heraldry over their doors. As Kirkwall was mostly carved from rock and often follows the natural stone fault lines, it's easier for doors to understand the layout of the town. And at the end, because I don't really have that much to say on this book, uh, who all in DA2 got a cameo from Hard and Hightown? Here is my best guess. Don in Brennikovic is Donic Hendir, the man Anveline has a crush on. His last name might also be based on another guard named Brennan Avagon. I can't, it's on screen, I can't pronounce that last name. Um, she is a woman seen in the background of a lot of city guard quests. Jevlin, from the pictures, seems to be based on Carver, perhaps basing the awkward recruit part off of his time in the Templars or Wardens, depending on your world state. The name Jevlin could be based on Jevin, the corrupt captain that Aveline replaces early on. Magistrate Seamus Dunwald seems to share a name with Seamus Dumar, the Viscount's son that was killed by Patrice and used to rally the people against the Canari. Captain Hendalen is Aveline, and the last name seemingly being a combination between her old Mary name Valen and Donick's last name, Hendir. Mariel Dunwald is a female hawk as evidenced by the cover of the novel and in DAI, where if you leave a female hawk behind, the mysterious chapter stars Mariel. Which, a side note, Harden Hightown does not include the mysterious question mark, question mark, question mark chapter that only happens in Inquisition. Captain Belladonna is Isabella. It has to be Isabella. <laughs> It's Isabella. The elven barkeep in the hangman Ferris is Fenris. Maisie is Meryl, which makes the painted daisies on her door extra cute as Merrick's nickname for Meryl is Daisy. And unlike the critics entries, the novel does seem to have a cameo for Anders as the unnamed dour blonde mage who heals Donnan and gives him some sass. Sebastian Vale is the murderous man with the Starkhaven accent, Whale, which in the Codex entry, his name is Wagner. Interesting that they seem to have changed it to make it something even more obvious. And the old man in the Blooming Rose, Garen, is Hawk's uncle, Gamlin, who you can find in the Blooming Rose a lot in-game. About the cameos, Susika says this, I'm not sure how to process their gratuitous cameos from all the DA2 cast. It almost seems like they cast Aveline and realize they need to assign everyone else to roles, even if they're a tree standing in the back. In DAI, it's a fun little nod to the past game, but it seemed really fan y when I paid money for it. I, I feel like I would feel the same way were it not for the fact that this is based on the Dragon Age Inquisition Codexes so much. Like, if this were Sword and Shields, I would think, all right, they already did this, come on. But as this is kind of a longer version of what they already had, I don't know what else they would have done. Like, I think it'd be weird if they deleted information from the Codex entries and then Hard and Hightown didn't have that. You know what I mean? Anyway, I don't... I don't know what else they would have done. I just don't. Granted, yeah, they didn't need to add in 
more cameos that weren't in the Inquisition versions or to make Wagner more obvious into Whale. But it, I, it didn't bother me that much. It is interesting how your feelings change once you put money onto it, though. The novel. So, cover art. The cover design seems to be based on classic mystery novel look of the mid-century. People my age and we're a lot older will probably remember Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys with covers kind of similar to this. We have a shadowy Donnan in the back in his guard armor with Lady Marielle, quote-unquote, in color on the front. What's interesting is that while Lady Marielle is described as having daggers like it's shown on the cover, she is wearing the mage hawk armor. I guess even Bioware didn't really like the rogue hawk armor, but whatever. Normally I also talk about the back cover, but at least on mine it's just color blocks with some words in the Kirkwall logo, which is not that interesting. Overall, I, I think it's a good cover. It's not really my style, but I appreciate the callback to an older mystery novel, even if it is questionable in a medieval setting, but whatever. Obviously, this is the newest Dragon Age novel as of recording this video, coming out on July 31st, 2018. For those of you watching this in the glorious future when the fourth game in the series has come out, this is the first novel that has come out since the last game in 2014. And while there have been a few comic releases, this is the first major Dragon Age release in almost four years. And by that, I mean with how covered it was and how much publicity it got. Amazon rates this novel as a 4.1 stars out of 5, and this is now the lowest rated Dragon Age book, and I want to talk about this a bit. First, it's been out less than a month, so the rating is subject to change. Second, DA fans are frustrated currently with the lack of content, and I think this has a lot to do with the rating it currently has. While a lot of people knew what they were getting into, others just saw Dragon Age and auto bought it without really looking into it. So when they opened up the package to receive the shortest novel in the series, by like by a lot, by the way. Here, here's a picture of my copy of the book next to like all the other books. This guy's tiny. <laughs> but but yeah, when they opened up their package to receive a book that was extremely small and then also filled with a lot of text that came free with the game they most likely already had, some were upset. So, how do I rank this? I rank this as not really a Dragon Age novel, which sounds really shitty, so let me explain for a bit. It's sort of its own thing. Like, I think this is best as an art piece sitting on my Dragon Age shelf, or a coffee table book, as something to say that you own a piece of in-game material. And it seems that the book is made to be that, with Varric being the main writer and even a quote from Meryl on the, on the cover. It's not really a story about the world of Thetis, but it's a story in Thetis, if, if that makes sense. So I guess for the sake of my list, it's going to be last, but really I don't think Hard and Hightown and the other novels are comparable. I don't think it deserves to be the lowest rated novel either. It's a cute novel. I had a lot of fun finding out which the DA2 crew was who and thinking of how Varric was inspired to write this. This isn't for a casual fan to know more about the world of Theus. This book is for a hardcore fan that wants to own a piece of the world. I, I can see why this book got a bit of shit, and I, I, I get it, but I also think it's undeserved. Mary Kirby, thanks for the novel. I liked it a lot. It's really cute. And with that, thank you to everyone who submitted entries, and I look forward to what everyone comes up with next. If you have comments, artwork, or anything else, please send it in. Our next episode is going to be the first on Asunder, which is the last David Gator book of the series. Everyone be sad. Uh, we're going to be doing chapters 1 through 5, and please send in your submissions by September 2nd, 2018. Also, for those of you who want to know the future dates for Asunder, I have updated the spreadsheet with them and have linked it down below. So either comment below, send me an email at gildathon at gmail.com, tweet me at gildathon on Twitter, or PM user gildathon on Reddit. Darash Sherol.